Hi, listener. This is from ideology to unity, a spiritual journey where we let go of ego and ideological doctrine in favor of meaning, purpose, and unity as a whole. So I'm continuing my reading of um, Meister Eckhart, Selective Readings by Penguin Classics in 1992, it's published, uh, I think. Yeah, so I'm going to read about uh, Meister Eckhart's thought, Oneness. Um, 1994, pardon me. So, to reduce a great thinker's work to a single idea is always to risk oversimplification. Nevertheless, in the case of Eckhart, there is some justification for taking the view that the primary perspective is the controlling principle to which all else is into some degree subordinate, the concept of unity or oneness. A, the a theology or philosophy of oneness has as a, as a starting point the belief that the ultimate principle of the universe is distinguished from all else by virtue of the fact that it is entirely one and undivided. All except this one is multiple, contingent, and fractured. So this physical um, realm, let's say, or dimension of reality is a fractured one. But it is a fractured whole. And interestingly, I just thought of South Park. There was a game, a South Park game called The Fractured But Still Whole or something. And that's just like reality, right? Um, it's funny how Source has messages for us and things, like The Matrix, for example, or Westworld and stuff like that. And you just need to, you can pick up on them if you know what to look for. So, um, yeah, so, but the one is the whole, and it really is the one, um, even though there's fracturing on certain dimensional levels fundamentally it's all one and this so this means that the god and our consciousness is one but also that which the physical albeit fractured world around us um which we mentally shape is itself an emanation of the oneness that is everything and of the mind that creates everything. So basically, everything, including that which we mold, is one and source, right? Now, this is very much an intellectual understanding for me, and I've occasionally experienced it on a more, well, experiential level, but only occasionally. And, um, yeah, but what I hear, um, it's not just simply understanding that there's a oneness, but truly feeling that oneness is what you get with awakening. And this happens more commonly the more present you are. Um, I actually had a dream. Was it a dream? Maybe I was awake, but I was on my bed. And I was just like feeling this ecstatic joy. And I wonder, yeah, it does sound like that was... Um, that was presence or that was some kind of temporary uh, awakening experience because fundamentally I'm going through, humanity is going through an awakening, right? And uh, the extent to which we might only get glimpses of it at first, but Eckhart Tolle, who, interesting first name there, um, does say that it happens gradually. The, usually, it, usually it can happen gradually, the coming into presence or the being into the I am presence into the, the awakening right but in this case even though there were there was great depression that preceded it um it happened suddenly for him and the more we understand the ego through for example the master of my course of Aaron F. K., which 
I'm not advertising, I'm just saying that that's what I'm doing. That's one example, right? The more you understand the ego and how the mind works um, and what the negative, the fundamental negative foundational beliefs of the ego are and how it's dynamics and how it's just trying to like, it's just like a, the survival instinct subverted for social status and social survival, right? Um, it's rogue programming that's meant to be serving us, but instead it's like, it's a, a deeply wounded, and it's come from a deeply wounded and insecure place, I suppose. And In any case, the more you understand the ego, um, the more you can catch it when it's doing its tricks. And that way we can actually awaken quicker, potentially, than the gradual process of Scott Beckel, totally. But yeah, um, I guess we'll go back to the book. It is nice to record again. I, I was trying all this video editing. And yeah, it's good for me to learn a new skill, but it is nice to get back to this. So, um, all except this one is multiple contingent and fractured, contingent upon the one. But generally, the one is also understood to be in a dynamic relation with the rest of the universe, which originates from it and which thus also looks back to its source. Does that sound familiar? The one is therefore everywhere present since it exists only by reference to it, but it is also everywhere absent since for us, all objects of experience are multiple. And um, this to me connects to the idea of what we are, our being, the being that I am, the being that you are, the being that we are. It is an infinite presence, a being that is nothingness. So, and if it seems like a contradiction, that's because non duality is true. But it's also false because. Okay, okay, never mind that. Uh, <clears throat> that's kind of circular, but yeah. But it would be, because that's the one, that's the whole. Okay, okay, stop, okay. Right. <clears throat> the one alone is primal and permanent being. If indeed the term being is attributable to it, while being of all, that is multiple shall inevitably decay, redemption for Neoplatonists, such as Proclus or Plotinus, involves the ascent of, human, of the human mind away from the spheres of multiplicity and contingency back to a primal oneness, which is grasped through an ecstasy of the mind. So away from separation and duality to unity and oneness, and it's experienced via and or through an ecstasy of the mind. Why would it be ecstasy? Because it's joy in being, right? And that is what you come from, a lot you get from love. And yeah, I, I love how this fits together with everything else I've studied and learned, you know, yeah. The challenge to Eckhart, the Dominican is fundamentally to set a vigorous metaphysics of the one in the context of the Christian revelation, which in the doctrines of the Trinity and the incarnation profess multiplicity precisely at the level of the Godhead. So a vision of the Christian revelation often has the idea of a multi separation at the heart of God, of their idea of God, which might be a problem with the whole theology of that established establishment Christianity. But of course, that may well be deliberate. But that said, in the idea of the Trinity, there are three different aspects to which 
the Trinity can perhaps have certain things for us to learn about uh, when it comes to um, God the Father, God the, the Holy Spirit, and Christ. Uh, of course, and miracles would go into this, and uh, go more into those uh, the intricacies of this. But this idea that there's not a compatibility between New Age thought or mystical thought in general and like uh, Christianity is untenuous. No, wait, I said that wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's tenuous. Like, there is, uh, it is definitely compatible, and the way it can be understood is like in a way that Meister Eckhart understood it. Whether or not one is Catholic or not, one could potentially, if one's a Christian and interested in mysticism, they could um, see it in this kind of way, and also. And this is fundamentally dealing using the existing Christian theology, right? And also, I mean, of course, in miracles, it fundamentally uses Christianity. I mean, there's a reason, there's a reason why Christianity exists, right? Despite all of how it was corrupted and institutionalized by the powers that be, you know. There's a reason why Source had it come into the collective consciousness and during the age of Pisces. And, you know, there's certainly, there's truth to Christianity. We can't just brush it off. Now, certainly in Buddhist thought and Asiatic thought, you know, there's certainly, you could say perhaps more mystical truth to that, but. If we were to treat East and West as opposites, well, we need to unify, we need to unify those opposites. And at the same time, there's also another thinker to consider here when it comes to Christian mysticism would be what's it called? Neville Goddard. I'm getting into Neville Goddard at the moment, actually. And um, he's fundamentally interpreting the texts from the Bible in terms of the Father, God the Father in the Bible being um, the, um, the creator, Wait, the, the, the source part of us, the observer consciousness source part of us, I think, of being the creator in that sense, source, the I am part of us being the sun, which is Christ, uh, which is fundamentally linked to overall source. There's overall source, well, that is. Then the source, this piece of source that we are, which is fundamentally one with all that is anyway, that's the Christ consciousness, and that is... Um, Wait, he didn't say Christ consciousness, but yeah, that that is the I am presence, and that's the observer that we are. Then there's the ego, which is he didn't refer to the ego, but there's the subconscious, and that the subconscious, according to him, is like it's like the wife to the the husband sort of thing, and it's like reflects back and manifests what is conditioned into it by the conscious. But if there's a mal conditioning, if there's a rogue aspect of that conditioning or base, if what's conditioned into it is fear-based, um, and that tends to happen, that's tended to happen our third density experience in Earth, even from birth and past lives, uh, for a long time, uh, what happens is you get fear-based programming, and then that reflects back um, as so. Especially if like what you're thinking of when you go to sleep affects this the next day, and that means that 
a lot of our automatic thought patterns that are programmed into our minds, essentially, are fear-based, guilt-based, and so forth, based emotions. And thus we're acting out these things. And often, unless we can, with a more, and with higher intensity of a different emotion, a positive emotion, replace it, it will remain the dominant emotion. And if you keep reacting the same way, we're just repeating the same pattern again and again and again. And people have done that for lifetimes, repeating the same old patterns, developing all this karma, which we're all burning off now in a chaotic, messy way, which is why the world is the way it is. But it has to be this way for the awakening to even occur. So that's what Neville Goddard and then I'm just beginning to learn, and I've never got it, but that's part of what it teaches is um, the more run we are by our con unconscious programming as well, like the more, the less that we are proactively aware of this, the more we're basically just running on existent programming, program that often is gone rogue or gone fear-based and guilt-based and hate-based or whatever, right? And so if we're just automatically going on a whole bunch of negative programming and we don't even know what, there's an alternative, we just keep on going with that, then that is a sort of low frequency state and a low awareness state where we're just along for the ride largely and we have opportunities even then to notice things uh, and gain awareness but if we don't we just repeat the same old same old um, and the extent of our conscious awareness is the extent to which we can consciously direct the interplay between conscious and unconscious masculine and fame and feminine within us and as we unify those two together by becoming more and more conscious we this union this divine union within us will manifest in more with more providence and bountiful abundance and love and success and joy in life externally experienced um so the ego in a sense is the subconscious now this is where perhaps Jung was off however much we can learn from Jung perhaps he was off in certain regards and this is something that Christ as a, the Christ consciousness that was channeled in A Course in Miracles what is said is that in a sense Jung was more right than Freud wait no Freud is more right than Jung in that there was um it's the idea of that the ego is all this subconscious programming this id but the ego is basically like um yeah it's like rogue program it's like the subconscious all this subconscious stuff but it functioning in a rogue way right but he saw it just inherent to the human nature that that's just how it is we've got all this negative stuff these negative instincts and we need to rule over them with the super ego otherwise we'll just in our ego just be acting out all this otherwise we'll just be acting out all this negativity but the mistake Freud made was he took that as the human nature was in fact it's it was the fallen state that we've been in since well the fall of the Atlanteans or something you know um there are some there's some There are various theories about how this originated. One theory is that it, it was some sort of so-called Luciferian rebellion that was, according to one channel papers, that were originated on Mars. I, I don't know. That's one theory. But basically, yeah, there was a fall in consciousness and that, that, that part of our programming became uh, fear-based and all that. And that this, this has gone on through generations um, for a long time. And now is where we come out of it.
And if we integrate these mystical, mystical teachings or whatever that are fundamentally compatible Christianity, and if we share this and speak our truth and we resonate with this and we can share that, and those who, as more and more people resonate with that in the West, perhaps, perhaps those who are ready and receptive will be like, aha, oh yes. And we will have Christians becoming more mystical. But this isn't something to be like, well, we should change their minds, right? And convince them, like, like it's an outcome we're trying to do and we're trying to set some sort of control. No, 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 no. We just speak our truth. And that can include potentially um, the, the overlap between mysticism and Christianity or a mystical interpretation of Christianity. And insofar as we do that, that may help the awakening, especially those who are coming from a more Christian backdrop or background in how they see things. Yeah. So I miss these tangents. <laughs> so, um, Firstly, Eckhart affirms that he does indeed find the notion of the one most adequate, the most adequate way of speaking of God. All else, God, the good, the all-powerful, etc., appears to add something to him, and therefore to conceal him. For how could the infinite be added to? Everything that could possibly be is already there in the infinite that's why the akashic records have access to everything even that which has never manifested before so oneness alone comes close to capturing something of god's essence in language without clothing him in concepts which seem to owe more to our nature than to his but the doctrine of the trinity of course demands multiplicity in god and there are passages in which Eckhart appears to place the unity of God above his plurality, or at least to make his oneness prior to the three his threeness, which I would say makes sense, honestly. Like, wouldn't, even in a Christian setting, sense even, wouldn't the Trinity be not only those three, but also the whole of those three? as one um that may even be orthodox to be honest and by orthodox i mean catholic <laughs> or orthodox greek orthodox you know you know or, but orthodox establishment you know but yeah so underlying such passages in eckhart's belief that names and concepts belong to the realm of created things they denote specific and local and specific and localized being also it kind of suggests a negative theology this idea that truly you can point to god but truly you can only really represent what god in terms of what it isn't or at least that or and also this almost iconoclast position that you can't really do justice by describing god i mean it also reminds me of the idea you can't even visually represent god um and do it justice that it's beyond actually that's actually an interesting comparison because this is unlike this is saying words can't truly do god justice the iconoclasts and islam say the iconoclast was a sort of uh considered a heresy in the orthodox greek orthodox faith and the orthodox, the, the iconoclasts in Islam say that you can't visually represent an icon of God because an icon is false representation because God is God, right? And, and um, but they are okay with the written symbols of it. That's not to say that. So basically, well, they both actually got the same point, which is human representations of God might help us understand uh, the divine, but they aren't the divine, they're pointers. So, and Buddhism has this feature as well, where it's indirectly pointed to in a mystical way, and you need to kind of 
experience it um, and allow yourself to experience it as a practice, I guess. But this tendency to prioritize God as one at the cost of God as three must be set against another, which is also strongly present in Eckhart's thought, the belief that God is a sense essentially fertile. God the Father constantly gives birth to God the Son. In other words, God is always dynamic and he is always, repro always reproduces himself within the Trinity and within the human individual. The cup, which is an essence the cup with an essence of, a liquid essence of consciousness that can be constantly overflowing with love that comes from the foundation, the source of all, and which is itself the fount an infinite fountain. And yeah, so, Eckhart stresses that this generative function of God is not incidental to his nature, but is his very essence. And after all, if, this, if God is infinite and has no limit, the creation of God would have no limit also in space or in time. And thus, the infinite creation of God would always be occurring infinitely. Yeah. So a fountain with no end. It is not the case, therefore, that Meister Eckhart simply re rejects Christian doctrine in favour of a Neoplatonist metaphysic. Rather, his thought seems a bold attempt to reconcile the Neoplatonist inheritance with Christian orthodoxy in a way that parallels the fusion of Aristotelianism, Aristotelianism in, and Christianity that we find in the theology of Thomas Aquinas. That he should have ventured upon the task at all is the result of his strong Christian convictions, together with his deeply held belief in the timeless veracity of Neoplatonic philosophy. At one point he wrote that the pagan philosophers Moses and Christ all professed the same truth, although each did so differently and at different levels of realization. Thus the pagan, that is to say Neoplatonist philosophers, taught the truth, while Christ is the truth. In any case, whether we judge the fusion to be successful, or whether we feel that there are residual tensions in Eckhart's exposition of the Trinity and the Incarnation, his work stands as one of the great theological and philosophical syntheses of the Middle Ages. And I agree. Um, I'm getting into this, I really am. Um, so, what I'm going to start doing with these readings, unlike before, is I'm going to start, I'm going to allow myself to stop after a short amount of time and then start again so that It'll be easier in me and I won't need to edit so much. I'll just be able to literally edit through my recording process. Um, I've been wanting to unlove lots of smaller episodes. I've been getting to editing partly for that reason, but perhaps a more elegant solution is simply my manner of recording. This is actually pretty funny. I was trying to, so I was to figure out how to do it. I put a lot of effort into this, but maybe it's as simple as, look, I just did a section of what? Three pages? No, two pages, pretty much. And I can stop here, stop the recording, uh, and do the next section, and spend about 20 minutes doing that or something. Seems reasonable. And I only just thought of it. Well, no, I did come up with the idea before, but then I forgot, so. <laughs> all right, all right. So... I hope you enjoyed it. I'm definitely enjoying this. And uh, why not subscribe and uh, like or whatever, or not, you know, it's up to you. And um, yeah, uh, have a great day and bye for now.